uh, hi, I, uh, I have a, a confession to make. Uh, I am absolutely obsessed with measurement. I, I, I just spend my life trying to measure everything. In fact, one of the happiest things that I got this week is that I got a new operating system that can measure things. Uh, so I cannot be more exciting. However, I know how you feel. You must say, well, measurement probably is the most boring topic in the history of humankind. And, uh, and, and you know, my wife tells me that almost daily. Uh, <laughs> um, but I am obsessed with uh, measurement because I think we are lousy at it. We just, uh, for example, don't measure the quality of our relationship. We only count when they break up, when they have a divorce. Uh, we don't measure the degree of sadness. Uh, we mostly diagnose uh, depressions. Uh, we don't measure how we are polluting a particular lake. We tend to wait until it's lost. We don't measure when a society is upset. We wait until they riot. Uh, we don't measure, for example, human rights violations. We wait until you have massive exodus, which is what is happening to my country in Venezuela right now. We measure very, very badly. And to me, the fact that we have made some good decisions in the past is mostly the outcome of luck, but not of wisdom. So let me tell you more or less what are the type of mistakes that I see uh, happening repeatedly. First, uh, we tend to measure uh, very infrequently. For example, I go to the doctor every year, like most of you probably go to the doctor, and to be honest, uh, it's a horrible experience. My doctor, she has been telling me for 21 years, every single time, she says, Roberto, you are losing your hair. Yeah, I, thank you, I know. Uh, uh, you are one year older, you are fatter. I mean, I, I don't understand how telling someone that you are older, uglier, and fatter will motivate me to eat more of my veggies. I mean, there's it's no chance. We measure very infrequently, and we measure outcomes, and that mostly produces regrets. It's very difficult to act when you only measure regret. The second problem that we have uh, is that, unfortunately, uh, we tend to also measure very extreme behavior. Uh, so not only late, but very extreme behavior. So, uh, for example, we don't uh, uh, co uh, compute the amount of consumption of drugs of a particular city. We, we don't. What we do is we count how many kids enter the emergency room with an overdose. And they are, they are related, but they are not the same. We are trying to make an assessment about the behavior of the average citizen by looking at the extreme consumers. Very unlikely they behave the same. Very unlikely they respond to the same messages. The third mistake that we tend to make is that we are almost always dependent of of uh, our perception uh, about a particular event to be able to measure it. And let me give you an example, this is a little bit harder, but if you, if you think about it, in 2013, uh, almost every week in the news, we hear about number of lives that were lost of people escaping from Syria. And it was almost like a countdown every single week about what was happening in that horrible tragedy. Have you heard about any person dying in the last six months? Well, there are only three options. Either we have no more human rights violations in Syria, they are holding hands and singing Kumbaya, my lord, Kumbaya. Okay. Either one, or the boats don't sink, or we are not paying attention because we are not outraged anymore. Very difficult to solve some of the deepest problems of society if you require to be outraged and surprised every single day to be able to act. The last one is that we tend to concentrate on statistics that even though they might be related, they're truly uh, not that meaningful. For example, you know, I ask uh, the people here from, from registration, how many women they thought was today in the, in the crowd. And they told me that, you know, about 50%, a little bit less than 50%. So congratulations, 47%. That's way better than loser New York that had like 35, you know? So I didn't know what to tell you, but, you know, Boca Raton rules, yeah! <laughs> but, 
you know, if I have companies that come and tell me, Roberto, I increase the number of women in, uh, in uh, uh, senior positions between 25 and 35. And, you know, my reaction is, well, good for you. That's great. You're moving the needle in the, in the proper direction. But then I immediately ask, do you treat them better? Do you pay attention to them? Have you created an environment where they can flourish? Or you just have them there like collection items. <laughs> the, the second one is very unlikely to solve the problems of discrimination. Very unlikely. And what is worse about that statistic is that it gives a false sense of accomplishment. I got the women to 45. Oh, I'm a genius. You, well, you are 40, you are a loser. I'm, I'm sorry, no chance that is enough. That doesn't mean we don't have to increase the percentage of women in corporate America, we need to. But if we stop there, we will not solve the deepest problems, which is the hostile environment where they have to live every single day. We measure late, only extreme events. We use statistics that are incorrect and we use mostly perception. And only when we're upset is when we pay attention. We need to change this dramatically. This is a first issue for the world. Let me talk about innovation. Innovation is, after all, an economic uh, a, a decision. This is more or less what we have been discussing today. And innovation is one of the areas which is very difficult to improve the, the, the measurement. So and what I'm going to do is to try to offer you an alternative about how to think about innovation. But let me start first thinking about innovation as this economic, incentive, economic decision that is subject to incentives and is subject to the way we measure success. And in fact, we have had many people today to talk about the world's success. You see, truly what they mean is commercial success. A lot of times, what we do, and one of the mistakes in innovation, is that we tend to associate private benefits with social benefits. They're not necessarily the same. There are many ideas that are very good for the private sector, and the way we do that is we have an idea, we embody that idea in a product, we actually commercialize the product, and we make profits. That requires a certain amount of decisions and, uh, and, and, and uh, capabilities to be successful. And you can make a mistake on any part of the process and you will fail. But there are some ideas that just cannot be embodied uh, in a product. We just can't. Can you imagine poor Isaac Newton today uh, invents the theory of gravity? Well, what do we tend to do? Well, you know, when you are an inventor, the first thing that you do is you tweet, no? He said, guys, I just invented the theory of gravity. Super cool. <laughs> and then, you know, somebody says, you are a loser. What are you going to do with that? Bouncing balls? And you know, when you pick up, you know, when somebody insults you on Twitter, what you have to do, we have learned, you have to reply. You are a bastard, ungrateful. I'm gonna go to a venture capitalist to give me the money and I will do something that crushes you with the theory of gravity. And the guy says, and then a VC says, I am drunk right now and I still think that your idea is stupid. <laughs> the guy, I'm going to create a cryptocurrency called the Gravity Coin and I'll take over the world. And then LeBron James says, the theory of gravity is a hoax because in the court I gravitate and levitate from one place to the other. Loser! Two million retweets, the theory of gravity is dead. Poor, I mean, poor Einstein doesn't even dare to think about the theory of relativity. That one you cannot even explain. <laughs> so, not everything is for sale. And some of the greatest idea of, that we need to invent need to solve problems that will have social benefits, but not necessarily private benefits. Unfortunately, we need those ideas desperately. And for that, you need a different type of, uh, of approach. You need an approach of, of courage, approach of dare, daring uh, the odds. You need to actually have faith that you will succeed. You need the tenacity that comes from the fact that you know is badly measured, that you will not reap the benefits. The second problem we have in the, problem, in the issue of innovation is that we measure probabilities very badly. We human beings are very bad at small probabilities. I remember, this was about 20 years ago, we were in a mall walking, uh, so my wife had my son in a, in a stroller, and I was walking holding the hand of my beautiful four-year-old Alexandra. So we're walking on the mall, and my, my daughter says, Dad, 
can we play hide and seek? I said, of course. This is the largest mall in New England. It will be great. There's so many places to hide, so many places to seek. Then immediately we hear the voice, stop. That, by the way, that's my wife. <laughs> stop. Somebody, my kidnap, my daughter. Yeah, you, you, you have a point. <laughs> so anyway, we continue walking. And I... I made a mistake and I started thinking. I know I should have not done that. Anyway, so, so I tell my wife, well, if the issue is the probability uh, of, of, uh, of kidnapping, what if we hear on the speakers that a kidnapping has taken place and that the kidnapper has left the building? Well, because there are less kidnappers than kids in the world, that means that the probability of kidnapping goes down. Will you allow us to play hide and seek then? You are an idiot. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait. No, no, no. What if there are 10 kidnappings? I mean, can you imagine the probability that an 11th will ever take place? After they announce that 10 kidnapping has taken place, the probability of kidnapping has gone down to zero. And then my extremely beautiful daughter says, yes, mom, listen to that. He is a statistician. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, my daughter is a total nerd. She graduated from MIT. <laughs> so, uh, so um, we are very bad at evaluating small probabilities. And what we tend to do is we either underreact or overreact. We do this every day. And almost all the crises in the world come for, because of that event. In the United States, since 1995 all the way to 2006, we thought that real estate prices were never going to go down. And during those 10 years, you probably were right. But in 2006, things reverted, and we had a crisis. Today in the United States, we are borrowing and running deficits in the private sector and in the public sector. And we are assuming that whatever paper we issue, the world will buy it. And by the way, that's true today. That will be true the next quarter. That might be true the next year. But forever? No chance. At some point in time, someone will figure out that we need to pay our debt. But we act as if that event will never, ever happen. So what occurs in reality is that innovations that produce massive social benefit, that have a tiny probability of succeeding, are completely and absolutely ignored, disregarded. We don't even care to search for them. We are under-investing in those ideas that are going to solve the important problems of the world. Things like discrimination, human rights violations, human trafficking, women empowerment, income inequality, good jobs, education, healthcare. Those require tremendous amount of sacrifice. And very likely, the inventor will not reap the benefits. I don't want to leave you with a negative message, but actually with an action and a challenge. There are two ways to deal with this. One is to wait for people to improve measurement. And I'm telling you, I'm devoting my life, and many people are devoting their life to try to understand how we can measure better. But actually, I don't think the world should wait for us. I mean, we're slow, we're academics, and you know, it just takes time. You can still take actions, and I think that that's what's important is to understand that the reward system is different. I need people that are careless and that are dreamers. Uh, those, I don't know, you probably have met some of them. We call them teenagers, OK? <laughs> and, and as this extremely famous American philosopher, Katy Perry, said, you just have a teenager dream. <laughs> That's mostly what we need. In some. We have to differentiate between success and fulfillment. One of the greatest uh, privileges that I have at MIT is that I have all these alumni that come back over and over again uh, to MIT. And you know, one of the greatest things is they tell me, oh, I remember the joke that you told in one class. And you know, truly, I prefer to be remembered by my sense of humor than by the content of the classes. But, uh, so, so, but in some sense, they remember the jokes, and that's, that's a good thing. 
But the other part is that I find myself talking more and more and more with some of these incredibly successful individuals. And, and success in, the, in, in terms of the things that we tend to measure, position, power, uh, the amount of money that they make, the amount of influence that they have. There's a very interesting pattern. Many people that will be successful among those dimensions, they don't feel necessarily fulfilled. It is actually very clear that in their lives, there's something that is missing. However, every single one that says that they have found fulfillment, they define themselves as extraordinarily successful. Every single one of them. So my challenge to you is that you find the inner teenager in yourself, that you grab that with one hand, and you have a ruler on the other. <laughs> and just go out and measure the world. Dare to dream carelessly, because the world is just waiting for people exactly like you. Thank you so much.